Last week we were unable to complete our study in Matthew 23, 15. We're going to do that tonight. And then we're going to start into another passage which we also will not be able to complete. And we'll try to complete that next time. So we're going to get the last half of one passage and the first half of our second one then tonight. Seems like all of this material, I generally seem to fit better in a two-hour slot for teaching, as you've noticed, than a one-hour slot. Thank God I don't have 15 minutes and I have to be through. I would never make it then. <laughs> but I fit a lot better in a two-hour slot. I type messages that are geared toward 60 minutes and they go 120. So, so much for that. So I'll finish what I started last week, which is, uh, as one brother noted, the most boring and the least important of the uh, proselytos passages, and I would tend to agree. And then we'll get into certainly one of the more exciting ones, which will be over in the book of Acts. So if you'll turn back to Matthew 23, 15, we want to pick up there again. We've gone through most of this, and we just have a little bit to say in a short conclusion here. Four times in the New Testament, proselyte, the technical term, appears, always meaning just that, a proselyte in the technical sense of the term. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land. We've looked at that phrase, to make one proselyte. We've looked at what's the emphasis of one there. Is it large investment, small return, or is it look at the investment and look at the sorry conclusion, not just small return, but sorry return, sorry conclusion because of the way the verse ends. And this is a phrase we want to conclude on then tonight. And when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. He's not disputing the fact that they make proselytes. He's not disputing the fact that they are, in some sense of the word, successful in their proselytizing activity. And it's, it's proselytism, not to Judaism, but all the way into the cult of the Pharisees. And then we end with this um, very interesting thought. It blasts them, for sure. When he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Now, the Pharisees, remember, are the strict ones among the Jews. They're more strict than their liberal countrymen, the Sadducees. And they'd never be satisfied with any one of these so-called proselytes of the gate. They'd never be satisfied with that. And that's why, since the technical term is used proselytos, we know that it couldn't have reference to a proselyte of the gate. Whether they ever even appear in the New Testament is another matter. We're on our way looking at that, by the way. But for a Pharisee, he would never accept a proselyte at the gate as strict and legalistic and binding and going all the way as they were. It would have to be a proselyte. And whenever you use proselyte, you mean a proselyte. There's only one kind, and that's a proselyte, which would mean you've got to go through those three steps of circumcision, baptism, and sacrifice, plus, plus, plus for the Pharisees, keep all the oral laws of the Pharisaic sect. Now that, of course, what, is what makes this whole scenario here that's been presented to us very interesting. How in the world, how in the world could the Pharisees have made such converts? Willing to go through the three steps of initiation and then beyond that to the embracing of all of the oral laws, <clears throat> the tedious oral laws of the sect of the Pharisees. And so Jesus informs us that he becomes not just an hypocrites, but, I quote Robertson, with pitiless plainness, a huios genes, which is a horrible term for him to have used. A huios genes, with pitiless plainness, as A.T. Robertson has noted. Now, the term or the phrase huios genes is a Hebraism. It's translated in the KJV as child of hell, as child of hell. It's a Hebraism which meant, in essence, an exceedingly wicked person. Now, 
Now, literally, of course, what it says is a son of hell. And that's literally what it says, a son of hell. Son is more literal than child. But the essence of it was an exceedingly wicked person. So if you call a man a huios gienes, then hell could either be taken as one or the other of his parents. You know, you're a son of, you know, Mr. Smith, you're a son of hell. Hell could be either one of his parents or it could be his place of birth. You know, you're a child of um, North Dakota. You're born there. That's your homeland. So it's a horrible expression to use. Here is the big question about this indictment. He calls them, once he's made, in other words, let's remember what we're saying. You got a Pharisee, he makes a proselyte, a proselyte from pure raw paganism, a Gentile who converts all the way into the Pharisaic cult. And Jesus said, now this man is twice as bad as you are. We know what he thinks of the Pharisees. Later in this chapter, he calls them snakes. And how can you get twice as bad as a snake unless you got two snakes? But he says, you're twice as bad. You make someone twice as bad as you are. So here's the whole argument. Here's what people have fought over regarding this verse. This is the question about this indictment. How fair or accurate is it? <clears throat> How fair or accurate is it? To restate it, are we really to assume that these proselytes ended up worse than the Pharisees? those whom he calls snakes in verse 33? Or is this not a case of hyperbole? In other words, did Jesus really think, feel, mean, intend to imply that these Gentiles were actually twice as bad as this wicked generation of the Pharisees? See, he had to have known about these people. They would be Gentiles, just like you and I. Gentiles walking around in Jerusalem or Palestine, but who were Pharisees, Gentile Pharisees. Odd, strange mixture, to say the least. So he knew about these people. So does, in knowing about them, does he mean for us to infer that they really were twice as bad as the Pharisees? Or is he simply using hyperbole that, you know, you're no good and you make disciples that are no good and he doesn't intend for us to press that to its literal conclusion that they really are twice as bad. Here's what my answer is about that. <clears throat> and I gave it, by the way, on that EH56 tape that I mentioned last uh, Friday night. See, we've discussed this in the seven woes to the church's leaders. And I gave you what I felt was interpretation. That's been three years ago, and I still feel the same. It is meant to be understood literally. Now, I went into some detail on that earlier tape, EH56, in providing what I felt was the answer to this. And then whenever I was preparing these notes, without going over those, without remembering what I said on EH56, I sat down and rethought the whole issue. And I came to the same conclusion. So there are two witnesses. They happen to come from the same person. It's the same person witnessing twice. But I'm saying I rethought the issue not knowing what I said earlier. And I, and I came to the conclusion this is literal. Then I went back and heard what the tape had to say, and the tape says that it's literal. So I tend to think that it's literal here. I've come to that conclusion twice. Maybe if I try it one more time next year, <laughs> I'll come to the opposite conclusion. But so far, two out of two times, I feel that it's literal. And other commentators, not all, but other commentators feel that it's literal as well. So I don't want to go into a lot of explanation. If you're curious, you can hear on the earlier tape. But I will say this. I've got to answer it somehow tonight so that you don't have to go home and listen to it if you don't have the time or want to. I, I think psychologically it's easy to explain how converts often end up more zealous and bigoted uh, than their teachers. You know, the teachers are either born into it or at least they are mature in it. Whereas the proselyte, the convert, is, is one over to it. And listen to the imagery, is one over to it, which starts him in fighting gear right away. The teacher is probably a little more secure and stable and mature, even if it's a false doctrine and belief. He's a little more mature and stable in it than a new convert, a proselyte. And you can, you know, 
I'm saying psychologically it can be explained. You can look at your own past life. You can look at any people converted to any new ways or thoughts, religious or non-religious. And whenever you're first one over to it, what happens? But you don't have any maturity, but you're exceedingly zealous. You're exceedingly bigoted for your own beliefs. You are harsh against anything else that won't respond or won't line up with what you have to believe now. Whereas one who's been in it a little longer may have, as they say, mellowed out somewhat. So I think we see many examples in the development of theology where a man's disciples, you know, twist and narrow his teaching, let's say after the man's death, more than he intended. Uh, we've seen this just happen time after time after time. It's ha it happened, one of the best known examples with John Calvin and his disciples. Calvin taught very strong predestinarian doctrine. Uh, but then after Calvin died, younger people, you know, see Calvin, he's lived through this and his, he's mature in his beliefs and he's balanced in his beliefs, balanced scripturally in his beliefs. But these young men who've been won over to it, after Calvin dies and with him gone out of the way, they've, they've lost the, um, the, um, the mellowing influence. They've lost the factor of stabilization there with the man who founded all of this or who um, systematized all of it in institutes. With him gone, now these young men don't have his maturity. And they come up with these notions that have since become known as hyper-Calvinism that went beyond what Calvin had to say. So, using that as an example, for instance, if we happen to disagree with Calvin and we would call him, you know, a child of hell, then what would we call those converts or those disciples under him but twofold more the child of hell? Because they took Calvin's doctrine and they lacked the maturity or the stability or the age or the sagaciousness or something. They lacked that and they pressed it to conclusions and they pressed it with such vehemence and such spirit and such hatred that they went beyond their founder. Now that is going to be very important for some things we're going to say later on. So we're concluding with the most important note about this verse. The Pharisees were one thing. By the way, we don't see Jesus making... Um, any criticism of these Gentile Pharisees, I mean, the Pharisees that he always is running into would be the majority of the Pharisees, the Jewish ones. But yet from his own teaching here, he said, he realized, I'm sure, from knowledge of traveling around in Israel, that these Gentile converts to the Pharisaic way were twice as bad as the Pharisees. The Pharisees with, and remember, that's what this chapter is about, a critique of the Pharisees. And he just scathingly denounces them here. And so with all of that denunciation, then imagine that, you know, doubled or tripled or whatever. That's what he would have to say. I mean, if you think the Pharisee was strict and legalistic and binding and lacking in love and overly technical and all of these things, the Gentile Pharisee would have been twice as bad. And so some people say, well, that's hyperbole. There's just no way that someone like a Gentile Pharisee would actually end up twice as bad as a Jewish one. Well, I think that just a, a brief thought about psychological development would tell us that it's not hyperbole. We see it happen. How many times does a minister stand up and say something and then people take it differently and then take it too strongly? They don't take it with balance of other things that have been said. You just see that happen. It's happened in our own church. It happens in every church. It happens with, with religious topics and non-religious topics. Get some famous economist and then let him gather a few disciples under him. And these guys will go out blasting away with both barrels. Their teacher only shot with one. You'll find it in every group. And I think that's what we're finding here. So in other words, what we're, gonna, what we're saying here, what we're hinting at, if you haven't picked up the hint, is watch out. The New Testament days, watch out for any proselytes. I mean, here it's a very specific form of proselytism. They've converted to the Pharisaic sect. But whatever mu whatever's true of Pharisees, Gentile ones, must be true of other types of proselytes as well. So the hint, as we'll get to later on, is watch out for these proselytes. These are Gentile converts to Judaism who are vicious. They are fierce. They are twice as bad as the Jewish people are. If you think the Jewish people oppose Christianity, then wait till you see later on what some of these Gentile Jewish uh, people have to say. As Holtzman has very aptly noted in rhyme, the more converted, the more perverted. That, as Holtzman has said, I think sums up 
Matthew 23, 15. The more converted, the more perverted. Let me give you one reference from Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr around, let's say, 122 A.D., and this is in Dialogue Against Trifo. <clears throat> Dialogue contra Trifo against Trifo, 13.3. You can get all this from, you know, apostolic, the Antonicene Fathers, church writers. Justin Martyr, Dialogue Against Trifo, around 122 A.D., um, section 13, number 3. He writes as follows. You can't copy all this down, but it's the essence of what I've just said, or as Holtzman has said in rhyme, the more converted, the more perverted. The proselytes did not only disbelieve Christ's doctrine, but were abundantly more blasphemous against him than the Jews themselves endeavoring to torment and cut off the Christians wherever they could, they being in this the instruments of the scribes and Pharisees. Justin Martyr almost seems to have some reference here to this verse in Matthew 23 and verse 15. So remember that as we'll, we'll need this later on. It's a very important point for later studies in the book of Acts. The proselytes did not only disbelieve Christ's doctrine, but were more abundantly blasphemous against him than the Jews themselves, endeavoring to torment and cut off the Christians wherever they could, they being in this the instruments of the scribes and Pharisees. And then I have one final note on this verse in answering the question, why did the Pharisees make Gentile converts? That was a lot of time, energy, and money invested in that. To have to go all around the world trying to make converts. Why did they make converts? Well. One suggestion is to swell numbers from unlikely sources that they might boast or glory in them. Note to uh, Galatians 6, those last verses that we've given you some time ago. I'll look the verses up while you're writing. To swell numbers from unlikely sources that they might boast or glory in them. Galatians 6, 12 through 18. Secondly, to swindle money or property from these people. Number three, both of the above. <coughs> Why else would they have made converts? We know that the scribes, the Pharisees, were rather concerned about money. Over in um, Luke 11 and Mark 12, we read how the Pharisees swindle money out of ladies, evidently Jewish women in Israel. And so it certainly would not be beneath them to swindle money out of new Gentile proselytes or converts. Okay, now we're going to come to a new section here, and I've debated on whether I should give you a little time to read over it. Uh, I think I will. Uh, we can keep the tape going, but I'm going to give you a few moments to read over a section before I launch into it. It's very, very important. We're only going to look at half of it tonight. But if you'll turn over to Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. I started to, to give you assignment last week, and I just thought I'd wait till now, make sure that it's all fresh. Why don't you just take a few moments to read over those verses? See what type of problems we have. We're going to find another section with proselytoi here. We're looking for the proselytos passages. This is a notoriously important section in Acts. But it's on the somewhat difficult side as well. First 13 verses of Acts 2.
Now for our second occurrence of proselytos in the New Testament, we turn to Acts 2, verses 1 to 13. And at this point, I think I'm supposed to say something like this. From here on out, until we conclude our look at uh, the diaspora, essentially we'll need nothing but the book of Acts. There are times we'll jump back into the Gospels, but we could almost say all you'll need to bring is your book of Acts. I'm glad it's attached to the rest of your Bible, so you'll have the whole thing here when you bring it. But Acts is where this is going to be very important, as we've alluded to time and time again leading up to this. Now, you have to jump down into either verse 10 or verse 11, depending on what translation you have, to find our proselytos term. Here's our second appearance. Now, the third and fourth one will also be here in Acts, chapters uh, 6 and 13. So, of course, we'll stay here for those two references as well. <clears throat> now, as I say, the passage is, is famously important and notoriously difficult to interpret. I think that if we could say one thing about Acts 2, it's well known by everybody here in the church. Uh, here we're not back into some obscure Old Testament place or even in a New Testament chapter that few people take the time to read. Acts 2 is well known. It's birth of the church. We did JDS teachings from it. It's baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's baptism as the apostles practiced. It's the communal living. It's the apostles' doctrine. It, it's Joel's prophecy. I mean, he just has, has everything here. We spent a lot of time looking at Acts 2 before. But how much do we really understand what's going on? Now, the more I study it, the more difficult it becomes to me. We would like to think the more we study it, the easier it is to understand. But I would have to say the reverse. And I think this is true of all of Acts. The more we study, the more I, I will have to speak only for myself, the more I study Acts, the more difficult the book becomes to me. As difficult as, well, as some of the other books that we think are easy in the Word of God. And here, I think, is why uh, narrative writing, which is what we have here in Acts, is peculiar. Unlike Paul's epistles, where Paul is just setting forth what his doctrine is. This is the doctrine, and he sets it forth. Luke is telling a story, but are we to think that's all that he's telling us? Is he not telling us a story and then some? Paul's not telling us a story in his epistles. He's giving us doctrine. Sure, his doctrine sometimes is difficult to interpret, as Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3. Some of the things Paul says or writes, he said they're hard, they're difficult to understand, and people who are unstable rest them as they do other scriptures to their own destruction, 2 Peter 3. But with that being said, still, Paul is telling us a story, and that is, this is the doctrine. Luke is telling us a story, and then he's going evidently beyond that, or let's be a little more accurate, behind that, and he's telling us something else. Now, what we have done in an earlier class we did on the book of Acts was look at the story. You first of all have to familiarize yourself with that. In other words, you first of all have to know the alphabet before you can then get some of those letters, like from way at the very end, and, and jump over the middle and attach them to some letters way at the beginning, spell a word from that. But that's all we've done with Acts. That's easy to do, somewhat easy. And if you ever were one of those who complained back then of all of Paul's journeys and all of these stopping places and all of this, that's easy. That's the easy part. That's just a story. This is just a narrative told. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Well, what about Jack and Jill? What type of person was Jack? Well, now that's a different matter. Just knowing the story is pretty easy. That's all we've done before. And we're not, of course, going to do anything beyond that now because we're not studying Acts. We're studying the intertestamental period. But you'll see on a few stops that we take in ITP, in the book of Acts, how the book of, how the book of Acts has to be read. That's what we want to start doing here in chapter 2. But remember the distinction, and this is something that's just crucial to remember. Pauline epistles are fairly easy to understand because it's simply teaching there. But when you go to something like Acts, uh, I mean, there's never been a history written quite like this book. Uh, and history is not just a compilation of dates and names and battles. As any historian today knows, it is notoriously, proverbially difficult 
to look back into history and tell us the whys of what was going on. Any fool can memorize the dates and the names and the battles, but the why or which of these led to which of those, what led to what, that's very difficult to do. Historians today want to look back and give us what they call the causes of the Civil War or the causes of the Great War or the causes of the Second World War. That's notoriously difficult to do. Uh, even living during those times, what actually are the things and what are the things excluded? What are the things that lead to this event in history? So Acts being written by Luke, but the superintending power of the Holy Spirit is over him, intends to give us a very beautiful story filled with miracles and filled with sermons of the early apostles and filled with some of the daily life of the early church. But in telling us some of the daily life, what is the theology Luke wants us to understand? What is it behind? It's a story behind the story. It's the same in the Gospels. So what that Mark and Luke and John and Matthew just kind of tell us that Jesus went here and he taught this and then after a while he went to this place and they named the city and he did this here and then he went over there and he had something else to say. Well, it's one thing just to kind of memorize, you know, the, the, the narrative, the train of events, the itinerary as it were, but are those writers not trying to tell us something by giving us perhaps geographical names? Why, what's significant about what he said at a certain place? or about some other observations that are made. So with that all behind us, let's read this account. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. The whole section bristles with problems. Who are the they? You have to start looking for antecedents whenever you find pronouns like this. Who are, who are the they? The nearest antecedent would be the apostles. And then the next to nearest one would be the 120. So which group are we talking about here? Are the apostles, were the apostles the ones? Or are we talking about the 120? It just says they. We've got to be careful. We can't just read and say, well, it says such and such. No, it doesn't say anything except they. Then it's left to you to interpret who is the they. What does he mean by the they? Why doesn't he tell us who the they are? He kind of leaves that open. The day of Pentecost was fully come. They were all with one accord in one place. And of course, we like to often assume they were in the upper room. But were they there? We know they were there in chapter 1, but this is much later in chapter 2, a week to 10 days later. Where are they by the time we get over into chapter 2? And let's assume that we take that second option that the 120 are the antecedent for the they, 120 people in one room? I think the psychologist would come up with some neat way of explaining what this wind and fire and the speaking in tongues was when you get 120 people crammed in one room. <laughs> some hallucinations and imagination going wild here. And we know that right away Peter's standing up and preaching to everyone, these crowds of people around. Well, then how did they get in this room? Is he hanging out the balcony, you know, the Romeo Juliet scene there? What's going on? Seems like he's down somewhere near the temple whenever he's actually preaching. So as I say, it bristles with problems. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there's the baptism, the infilling, the birth of the church, what's best known and a cherished memory in the book of Acts. Now let's get into the material that we really need, though. And verse 5 is one of several crucial verses from 1 to 13. There were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews... That's no surprise. <laughs> we would think Jews would be at Jerusalem. Devout men, we would expect that as well. Out of every nation under heaven, that we wouldn't expect. I mean, throughout the Gospels, whenever we're told what Jesus is doing and is coming in and going out, he has a lot to do with the Jewish people, but they're local, they're native Jewish people. Oh, there is a Syrophoenician thrown in here or there for flavor's sake, but he's dealing with the local native Jewish people. Well, why doesn't Luke say something about the local people? What's significant about all of this 
that causes him to make reference to Jews in Jerusalem, devout men, but not the ones we would think that he would make reference to. Out of every nation under heaven. You say, oh, I know that. The answer is easy to that. These are Jews that lived in other parts of the empire that had come back to, to Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost to celebrate the feast. Well, I'm not so sure that's the answer. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue or language wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea. Wait a minute, in Judea? That's talking about Israel. That's where we are right now. So that wouldn't be any surprise that Galileans could talk in the language of the people of Judea. They all talked in the same language.